calls it a strike to count on Taylor. Reyes fires. Swing and a drive. Deep left field. This is way back. Walk him up. Chris Taylor. What's up, everybody? Welcome into Dodger Heads Live, presented by DodgerBlue.com, part of the Blue Wire Podcast Network. My name is Jeff Spiegel, joined tonight by Scott Gearman. Scott, 5-4 Dodgers victory over the Diamondbacks. Uh, got a little dicey there at the end. In the uh, long run, Dodgers get the win. Yeah, no, that's it. Whew. Yeah, I know. Uh, it's just kind of ho-hum throughout the entire game, really. And it, it just you know felt like one that they were just going to cruise to a victory. Brewstar made a little shaky. Vessia comes in, makes it shaky. And then Evan Phillips, we we're kind of calling for him there in the eighth inning there. And uh, comes in, and I know we're already seeing it gritty. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Well, Arizona, we know the struggles. They've won just seven now of their past 30 games. Seven and 23 Man. over the last, um, since July 1st. They've now lost seven straight. Dodgers, as I said, have won seven of their last eight. By the way, Giants lost tonight. So Dodgers extend the yep. NL West lead to five uh that that feels like it's about as big scott as it's been for a while and it just look the diamondbacks the mess that they're in the midst of we get it um but it, it things just seem to be clicking on all cylinders for the dodgers right now yeah no uh just like you said it this is the entire series with the padres felt like a just a real special one like a kind of a statement not that the padres are really threatening uh yeah. it, it felt that they needed it just from the pulse of Dodgers and Padres, how they've been, you know, the past two years to go into Petco, you know, long four game series, odd one to finish up on a Monday, but to, you know, battle back and capitalize on that and finish up down five. Oh, I haven't even had a chance to talk to you about that yet, yeah. but go ahead down five and then just go on an absolute tear score unanswered yeah. and then finish up and, and you head to Arizona and you come out and you get a win tonight. Um, there's just a lot to dissect tonight and things that I'll even admit that um, about Julio. Uh, it's just, it was good to roll off a win after that kind of a hard fought series against the Padres in terms of that they needed that series to yeah. come in tonight. It just, for me, I feel really good about this. This was a great win and just keep, keep building on the lead. Yeah. And look, I say Dodgers have won seven of their last eight. We all know the one that they blew was a massive blow up by the bullpen in the eighth yeah. inning. So we could have been talking about eight straight wins for the Dodgers. Of course, we're not, but we'll take it. Seven of their last eight. Again, Dodgers defeat the Diamondbacks five to four. Let's get into how this one took place. Of course, we're going to get to Julio Urias. We're going to get to your questions as well. So thanks, everybody, joining us live on Facebook, on YouTube. We greatly appreciate it. If you're listening after the fact as part of the podcast, thank you as well Dodgers in the diamond in, in Arizona as you said for the first of a weird little two game stretch get get on the board first in the second it was David Peralta at his old home in Arizona singling to lead off an inning and then Kike Hernandez RBI double another guy that just continues to rake um what have you seen from Kike we haven't gotten a chance you and I to talk about the Dodgers new additions obviously Lance Lynn not on the mound tonight um Ahmed Rosario not playing a big role but Kike Hernandez getting things going and I mean, he just keeps roping these balls. He's not getting cheated on any of these hits, these extra base hits. I believe they said maybe like his seventh double in 11 games or something for the Dodgers. I could have those numbers off. Um, it feels like that feels like those numbers are too big. But Kike absolutely roping balls all over the field right now. Yeah, no, he's looked absolutely terrific. He's looked confident in himself at the plate versus, you know, I, we talked early on that um, a lot of his play would come against lefties, but it's nice that Dave is allowing him to, a big thing that we talked about early on in the year is that I, like with James Altman specifically, uh, guys who have extreme splits or you hope they don't is you'd like to give them an opportunity. And yeah. what I'm happy with Dave is doing is giving Kike the opportunity be, to go against both sides because it's paramount for him to have that ability. Uh, it's not as useful to have guys with extreme splits where once, you know, the opposite hand comes in, they're kind of a dud. So yeah. Kike looks confident and that for him is big because he just uh, was one of the worst hitters in all of baseball prior to the trade. It kind of yeah. looked at that there was, they were just taking a flyer for absolutely nothing. It was like a, you know, the best thing he's going to provide is upside defense in the outfield and, yeah. you know, maybe some big swings, but I'm seeing confidence from him and I'm seeing him going up to the plate. Uh, and just like you said, he's really getting a hold of it and his exit velos have been something. Whew. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it, it is six doubles in 10 games since coming yeah. over to the Dodgers, by the way. So or um, so good stuff from Kike Hernandez. So again, he gets things going for the Dodgers, gets a run on the board there in the top of the second, and they extend that lead in the top of the fifth. We get a Mookie Betts RBI double, a Freddie Freeman RBI double, a Max Muncie sacrifice fly. All of a sudden, it's four to nothing. Dodgers, bottom of the eighth, the Diamondbacks claw back a little bit. They get two, Tommy Pham RBI single, Christian Walker an RBI single. Um, that's where things started to get a little bit dicey for the Dodgers. Brazier gets them the scoreless inning after Julio comes out. Then Vessia comes in, gives up a hit and a walk. He's going to go down with a third of an inning and two earned runs. And Bruzdar Gratterall, meanwhile, is going to have 0.2 innings with no earned runs. That doesn't feel fair. Bruzdar felt like he was the guy who gave up both hits that end up scoring both runs from Vessia. Um, but the Dodgers decide to save Evan Phillips to be their closer. We're going to get into that in a little bit. Thankfully, the Dodgers tack on in the ninth and some kind of a big play when you look back on it. James Outman um, draws a walk, a borderline walk, by the way, in the top of the ninth, but goes ahead and steals second and then comes around on a Mookie Betts RBI single. Scott, that was a huge play from Outman. If he doesn't steal second and doesn't come around, then the Diamondbacks could have potentially tied this one up because they do tack on two runs in the bottom of the ninth before Corbin Carroll grounds into a double play. He decided not to run out. So, I got to give some credit to James Outman. That steal in the top of the ninth, I'm watching it. It's 4-2. You know, hey, do the Dodgers need to be taking chances? Well, the answer is yes. You always need to tack on extra runs, even with Evan Phillips. So to see James Outman make that play, Scott, and then to see Corbin Carroll ground out to end the game and not even get out of the batter's box, two rookies, but you like what you see from the Dodgers rookie in that particular instance. Sure. Yeah, I'm. I'm everything you said, yes. I'll just, you know put an exclamation point there. It's been, it's been fantastic. I know, uh, you know, when James Altman was at his lowest, I remember tweeting out that this is, if this isn't the bottom, like the bottom of the, you know, of his struggles, this is it. But now yeah. we're seeing James Altman take pitches that are just, you know, inches off the plate and he's playing with confidence and at 14 steals on the year, he's becoming a weapon, yeah. and to, you know, to understand that, to get on base, uh, to steal a bag, base it from Mookie drives him in. I think it was Mookie, right? Yeah, Mookie's the one who gets yeah. the RBI single there. Mookie with the RBI, extend it, and that's place huge because that otherwise it would have tied the game, you know, barring everything else, if that's how you like to say things go in predictions. But that's just – that's a huge factor for James Altman. Yeah. He's playing with confidence. That's what this team is doing right now. They're all feeding off of each other. They're they're playing smart. They're not disconnected from each other. And it's just – it's fun. This is really good to see. You're seeing guys who are in their roles – and I'll talk about that some more. Um, and that comes with the bullpen about guys yeah. finding their roles and why Dave is putting some of these guys in these spots and why others aren't. Yeah. Before we get to the bullpen, let's yeah. do this. Let's talk Julio because it's a shame that we haven't mentioned him yet. This is the guy that's supposed to be the Dodgers ace, especially with Clayton Kershaw, not officially back yet expected back Thursday, six innings, shutout baseball, just five base runners, five strikeouts. I throw it up there, a 28% whiff rate. Um, you know, the fastball velocity is touching 94 and a half tonight. Uh, he kind of was be able to work every single pitch, gets gets a swing and a miss on every pitch, um, all four types of pitches that he threw tonight. This was the type of Julio that you love to see from the Dodgers. And I know the Diamondbacks are struggling, but it's just good to see him get confidence. It's good to see him work a full six innings. And this, this is encouraging. Of all the things that come out of this game, you could make an argument that Julio's performance – was more important than actually coming away with a victory because if the Dodgers are going to make a run this postseason, it's going to require Julio Urias to not necessarily be, you know, Cy Young candidate Julio, but just a lot better than what we've seen. And tonight was encouraging. Without a doubt. He's, you know, these, this little stretch here, you know, for a while I was like, you know, Julio, this is an all time bad spot for him to be in a walk year. A uh, time when he needs to really perform, and he has looked nothing like himself. He's, yeah. you know, you saw his numbers; they popped up on the screen after he's come off the IL. He's been he's been terrific. So yeah. uh, it's going to come with some bumps. Aside from the you know the start against the Orioles, Julio's been everything that we need in him. Just like yeah. you said, the the a deep run in the playoffs doesn't happen without Julio, because he's someone who will get in there, pound the zone. I, how many times have we seen him give up two in the first or second inning? And we're like, oh, here we go again. Yeah. And then he cruises through six. So tonight was big. Uh, his start against the A's, I think he had five whiffs. Tonight he rattles off, uh, I think, 12. 
at you know, 12 whiffs and he just, he looked great. He looked confident. He had, you know, location with his fastball. He looked really good. He was getting whiffs there. He was putting it in the zone and it, it was just a, you know, really fantastic start from him. And this is when the Dodgers are, are going, are going well. It's because the starting pitching is able to give them length. And that's, that's what we're getting right now. Yeah. July 6th, six innings, two earned runs, eight strikeouts. July 14th, six innings, one hit, one walk, seven strikeouts, no earned runs. Then you have the hiccup against Baltimore, five innings, eight earned runs. We know that's the career high. But then since then, six innings, three earned against yep. Toronto, five innings, no earned against Oakland, and now six innings of shutout baseball against the Diamondbacks. You'd love to see it. I'm curious for you, was there anything in particular that you saw from Julio tonight? Was it the fastball? Was it the changeup? Was it just his overall confidence? What kind of jumped out to you about what made Julio different tonight than the 5.0 ERA guy that seems like we've seen all year? Uh, you know, conviction. Yeah. Uh, and for me, you know, he, I, that's why I like, I love, honestly, I love having D train when he's on the, on the broadcast because <laughs> I like hearing when he's on there, he's got, you got a lefty on the mound. He's able to, you know, really give you some insight there and yeah. pitching with conviction is something Julio has done his entire career. Uh, and we've started to see that, but mainly for me, it's his fastball and Julio's got, you know, an incredible, incredible four seam. So for him to be able to pound that, get ahead, work that slurve. And because he's been, what I've noticed also, and I know you have too, is he's able to work that both sides of the plate. And he had one, I believe in his last start that he tried to, we, we did talk about this, that he tried to just, you know, get me over on a back door to a right-handed hitter. And he did it again and he gave up a homer. So this is st- stuff that I'd like to see him work ahead with his fastball, you know, barring the game plan, but it's when he's able to get ahead and really make hitters chase, expand their zone. And that's, yeah. this is when Julio's at his best. So he's, he's, he's phenomenal to watch when he's on. Yeah. Uh, and this is a good run from him. Yeah. Yeah. And, and look again, we've said it multiple times and I don't mean to sort of beat this into the ground, but it's true. Julio, you, I mean, I don't even think it's controversial, Scott. He's the most important player on the Dodgers roster. For the next two months. I mean, maybe you can make a case for Kershaw and his ability to come back, but is there any argument about like who is the biggest X factor for the Dodgers being able to make a run in the next two months for someone other than Julio Arias? Uh, you could, you could, you could make the case. That's, that's a fair thing. And on the pitching staff, absolutely. Often like we'll, we'll keep it with that. Uh, yeah. but I'm just talking who- like guys that, that could swing things like Mookie Betts continuing to be Mookie Betts, Freddie Freeman continuing to be Freddie sure. Freeman. Like, like I'm trying to think who else would be on that list. Maybe Max Muncy putting together a stretch on the offensive side. You could make a case. Will Smith maybe getting scorching hot. But it, it feels like to me that, you know, I, I hate to put everything on one player, but if you had to choose, the Dodgers postseason hopes rely maybe most of all on Julio Rios. I guess Walker Bueller, like if there's an update that he's back, maybe he's a guy, maybe it's Yancey Almonte and Caleb Ferguson, but I, I would pick Julio as the guy that like, is going to have the greatest impact over the next two months on whether or not we feel good about this team in the postseason. Sure. I think that's fair. And, that, and then you could say that. I think him and Kershaw are both, you know, interchangeable yeah. there. We'll have to see, you know, Kershaw's TBD. But if all things go well there, then you can assume that you're going to get starts. But I think that the pick of Julio uh, is is really a fair choice because uh, say they don't want to put so much of a load on on Clayton Kershaw. Um, yeah. Then Julio's, your, he's your one. He's your guy. He's, you know, po- there's, we're looking at the possibility that and uh, Julio yeah. is, you know, your game one starter for a playoff series. And that's, that's a, that's a good choice. So I, I do agree there. The more you think about it, that Julio needs to be on. And if we're seeing him there, there's your one. And he has the chance to, you know, possibly pitch uh, three times in a seven game, depending on what role, because his ability to come out of the bullpen, they might not have him do that so much because of their reliance on the need for starting pitching, yeah. but his versatility in that and his experience uh, because he has he he has so much confidence in himself, which yeah. is why I think uh, he's you know when times are bad it can get really bad because yeah. he he's not able to I mean he can but when when you've seen him just kind of throw stuff over the middle of the plate when he knows he doesn't have it but right now he's pitching with a certain um, uh, kind of for me it's kind of you know throwback for him he's he's yeah. he's, he's able to bring stuff out now if he's healthy. If he's finally got that injury stuff under control, uh, he's you're looking at an ace. You're looking at the ace of your staff. Yeah. Yeah. I, I loved, to your point about Dontrell Willis, there was a point where I think he had a 2-0 count. Will Smith calls a changeup, and he locates it on the outside. And Dontrell says, 
what a great call by Will Smith because not only is it the changeup, but he could tell Julio was frustrated. And he says yeah. throwing the changeup forces Julio to slow down a little bit, get himself under control. That's the type of insight that I love and his yep. ability to to do to get that. Even in the sixth inning, when he's trying to close that out, there was a moment where he misses with I think it was ball one to the last battery face, and he's screaming in his glove and barking at himself, that kind of thing. But he didn't overreact. He didn't serve up a meatball. Mm -hmm. He didn't walk the guy. He battles back. He gets the out. That's what you like to see yes. about Julio. And I, I think having watched him for a long time, he feels like a confidence pitcher. He feels like it's mental for him to such a large degree when he goes out there and believes that he's the best and believes that he can get there and, and accomplish whatever he needs to accomplish. His mechanics are dialed in. Then he's elite. And I think, that's this is such a huge building block for a guy who feeds on so much confidence. So again, I think the storyline of tonight can be nothing short of Julio Arias six shutout innings. Let us talk though, Scott, about the bullpen because I see the chat and I see folks in there. And is we can't it can't all be nice. We can't have nice things, Scott. We can't have a six inning, you know, shutout from Julio. We yeah. can't have a five four Dodgers win. We're talking about the the bullpen. We're talking about Dave Roberts. So Ryan Brazier the guy who can't strike anybody out and continues to put up zeros uh, did just that continue to put up zeros. Although he had two strikeouts tonight. So maybe I should rephrase that it's rare for him, but he gets two strikeouts, gives up a hit, no earned runs for him in the eighth inning. Dodgers are up. Um, what was it? Four to zero at this point. And the Dodgers go to Alex Vesia in that spot. Um, let me start with this. Set Vesia aside for a second, because I think the bigger question here for the Dodgers is for the longest time, they avoided having a closer, Scott. They put their best pitcher in in the biggest moments. And I'm going to say this at four nothing. I have no problem with Alex Vesia being the guy that they go to. It's a four run lead. I don't need my best pitcher coming in with a four nothing lead in the eighth inning. Saving Evan Phillips there is fine to me. My question to you, Scott, is when he puts two runners on. Is that the time that you want Evan Phillips in the game? They go to Brewstar. Brewstar gives up two hits. It ends up being two runs charged to Vesia. But that felt like the moment where, what are we doing? The Dodgers, for the longest time, have said, we don't have a closer. We've got a fireman, yada, yada, yada. They've switched. They now are calling Evan Phillips the closer. And nights like tonight are what make me question the decision-making there. You know, honestly, I think that I, I don't hate the move. Uh, I really, I, I'm okay with it because right. just to Dave's, just like I talked about earlier, this is the exact spot. Dave needs to find out what he has with the yeah. guys that he has and the amount of times that, you know, Bruce stars come in and he's, you know, he's found some success up in the zone lately. That's, you know, that's fine, but they're looking for him with a run of righties. He had Tommy Pham, Christian Walker and Lourdes Gurriel yeah. in a row. And you're looking for a double play ball. It yep. just so happened that he comes in, gives up single, you know, ground ball, uh, singles on a fly ball, or and you know, so that Tommy Fam hit could have been a double play that could have ended the inning. So yep. you know, at first and third at that time, one down, you know, a little bit to the left, and that's a double play. So you know, it could it's a 50 50 shot there. Uh, so I don't hate the move, Evan yeah. Phillips. There, I'm okay with it. Because then in the ninth inning, if things get hairy there in the eighth, you know, who are you yeah. going to? You really okay going Bruce Star? Maybe, but I think Dave's point to really when he kind of, you know, gave a pretty frustrating string of comments about the bullpen that he needs to know, you know, what he's got in these guys. That's why you didn't see Yancey come in. Just yeah. imagine if Yancey came in and blew it up, blew it up again. You wouldn't know what you have in him at all. You wouldn't yeah. have any confidence. So I'm okay with Bruce Dar going in there. He, you know, he had a shot to get a double play. It didn't work out. It doesn't always work out. But I think he's a guy that they're pretty confident that to go in there and either get, you know, it's going to be contact. It's going to happen. But the odds of him getting a double play, I think Dave thinks of that more so uh, in a spot yeah. where they do need one. First and third, force play. I, I'm okay with it. Yeah. And again, when, when Bruce Dark came in the game, it was still four, nothing. And there were yeah. two runners on. So we're not talking about like the, the go ahead run is at second base. Um, and I mean, where are you at? Let me ask you this. Where are you at on Gratterall? Like we played a game with Matt on Sunday night called, do you trust me? Um, do you trust Bruce Dark Gratterall? Situationally. I mean, I'd define that. What is, what does situationally mean? What's the situation where you trust him? He's, you know, I'd like to get every reliever with a cleaning. He, he yeah. but like if he's, I mean, eighth inning, for me, eighth inning with two runners on, you trust in a four, in a four, in a four nothing game. Yeah. 
to not to not what give up five or to just give up anything yeah i mean i don't know however you want to define so I, I mean if if he's going to get you know an out you trade an out right there that's fine right like yeah with one down sure like if he's going to come in give up a you know a sack fly it is what it is um but I, i'd have to look up you know his home run rate i don't think he's given up many on the year so I'm, I'm kind of okay with that as long as he doesn't give up you know the long ball uh he's given up i don't know hard contact, but I don't think he's given up many extra base hits recently. Like on the season, I don't think that's been kind of his thing. He's kind of shied away, but I'm okay with him. Like I don't love it, but they don't really have many options out there. Like situationally, it's if he's able to come in, get a fly ball, get an out, trade it for a run. Cool. But if he comes in, gets a double play, then you're like, that's big brain Dave Roberts. Good stuff. But you don't have many guys out there that are missing bats. That's yeah. why the the TBD and the news on Blake Trinan and Jimmy Nelson and where Emmett Sheehan being in the bullpen and Michael Grove, it's like he's that's why Dave needs to find out what he's got. So yeah. you, you're going to see this. It's just the fact that the offense is playing so well is why the bullpen can kind of it's going to get ugly, but yeah. he has to find out who he has. And that's why it's nice. It's not the division's not out of reach yet, but as long as the offense is playing like this, Dave can kind of mix and match. So yeah, that's why I'm like, I don't know where I am on him. I situationally for me is it, it, it has to be there, but I'm okay in that spot because his, what about you know, no, I, I just, you know, I, he had a run, but it's just, he's shown too much, too much prone like too prone to blow up too prone, not to be able to, you know, give up a knock or walk someone and kind of bring it back in. You'll know right away with Bessia if he's yeah. on or not. So it's like immediate, like they should yeah. know this in the pen. Like I, I'm, I'm sure they do, but once he gets on the mound, it just hasn't worked out. And when it's gone, it's, it's really tumbled. Yeah. His last, his last 13 and a third coming into this one, just three earned runs for Vessia yeah. with 17 strikeouts. Um, and I believe, and three walks. So, I mean, that's the thing about Vessia is like, he's quietly been really good lately. Turn it around. And, yeah. I mean, look, you could make a case. Like Caleb Ferguson's been doing the exact opposite over the last month and a half. He's yep. got a whip of like two. So if you're talking about lefties, the Dodgers are going to need Alex Vesia because he's their number two lefty. And <laughs> two weeks from now, he might be their number one lefty. Um, crazy, right? So, yeah, it's crazy. And that's, that's the way things go. And I think it's also like why, as far as relievers go, you know, don't die on any hills. Like don't die on the Vesia sucks hill because a month and a half from now, he might be the guy who's who's the best lefty you've got out there, which is just sort of a an interesting spot. So, but you're saying, Scott, as far as how the Dodgers handled their bullpen tonight, they go to Brazier, no issues there. He's been good. Four nothing lead. They go to Vesia. He gets one out, puts two runners on. They go to Gratterall, save Evan Phillips for the ninth inning for the potential save opportunity. You're good with that. Sure. Yeah. I mean, you know, if you it's the most you can from Bruzdar on. Or yeah. like from Bruce Daron, yes. Like if that's the spot he comes in, uh, try to get a contact out, try to trade outs for, you know, one or two and give Evan Phillips a shot to go in there and close the door with a two run cush. Like I'm fine with that. Yeah. Like that's, that's, that's as good of a scenario as you're going to get. If Joe Kelly's not available, that's, I'm fine with that. What? Well, okay. So is Joe, you trust Joe Kelly more than Gratterall? Oh yeah. Every day. Wow. That's okay. not even me being biased. Like he's looked, he's looked confident. He's, he's yeah. been on a roll since he's been here. He's got act, like swing and miss stuff. Like not that Bruzar doesn't, but he, he doesn't like he doesn't have that. He doesn't. So it, it actually so, is so like, he that's what I'm saying. So, stuff. but, but you know, my baby Joe is always ready to go. So what do you, what are we talking about here? If he's not available, you know, then it's kind of a grab bag. You have about two guys out there that you can really trust right now. Brazier, yeah. Brazier, you know, Brazier needs to get more swing and miss. And then they'll have three that you're pretty okay. Yeah, he had two. So it's great. If he builds on that and they're able to work on it and his fastball is looking good. Like he was able to get a punch on a fastball. And I love that. He got kind of, you know, pinched on a breaker. But I really liked what, you know, what Joe Kelly's brought to the team. He's brought, you know, three strikeouts, you know, yesterday. Yeah. I love that. Yeah, so I mean, you, look, you, you, have at, eight, you, you have an eighth inning. Metrics. Again, Kelly, Kelly, obviously an ERA of four and a half. Um, Gratterall and ERA of one and a half. You look at the FIP and they're basically the same. Joe Kelly's actually slightly better. So I, I'm not saying it's crazy. I just think um, there's probably a lot of people that might be surprised to hear you say that you take Joe Kelly over Gratterall because we're so attached often to ERA. And I'm not even saying it's wrong to be attached to ERA, um, but it just Bruce, goes Bruce to show, a special instance. Yeah. Like, yeah, big I agree. And it's, and it's no swing and miss. Um, 
you know, with him or Brazier typically. So um, Joe Kelly also, I think there's just, you've seen him do it before. And so we've seen the best version of Joe Kelly. So I think we kind of project the best version of Joe Kelly onto whatever version of Joe Kelly we're actually seeing. He's dialing it up over a hundred. So it's hard not yeah. to feel good. I, sure. I still, I still think I probably would have preferred to go Evan Phillips there with two runners on in a four, nothing lead just to put the fire out. If you can get Phillips out of there with zero or one runs, then Gratterall comes in in a clean inning in the ninth. I still think that's my preference, but obviously tonight of all nights is not the night to make that case when Evan Phillips was a mess himself and ends up giving two earned runs. And by the way, the last play of the game, Corbin Carroll grounds a ball down the line. Jeez, I mean, yeah. about as close to fair or foul as possible. Freddie Freeman sells it as a fair ball and then sees Corbin Carroll has literally not left the box turns the double play easily and gets out of it. So you can make a case. Evan Phillips caught a break there. You know, um, I'm guessing Corbin Carroll doesn't get many three, four, three, three, six, three double plays turned on him. So if he's booking it out of the box, who knows how that play ends. If that call yeah. goes foul, which it seemed like it probably could have gone either way. Um, but a great play by Freddie Freeman, a bad play by Corbin Carroll. And who cares what could have, should have, would have happened. The Dodgers win this one five, to four. We're going to get to some questions and thoughts here in a second. Let's get to players of the game, Scott. Something we do, and if you're in the chat, we like to do a podium here. Oftentimes, player of the game becomes a pretty simple one, i.e. tonight. I think it's pretty obvious who the best player on the field tonight was. So give us your first, second, and third place in the player of the game. I'll read through some box score stuff just to give us some perspective. Um, Julio Urias, six innings, four hits, one walk, five strikeouts, and of course, Zero earned runs, ERA down to 4.39 after this one. You got Brazier with the scoreless inning. Vessi and Gratterall struggle. Evan Phillips struggles as well. Offensively, Mookie Betts, two for four with a run and two RBIs. Freddie Freeman, three for five, a run and an RBI. And then you had base hits from Peralta, Rojas, and Enrique Hernandez. Dodgers only had nine hits in this one, and five of them belonged to Mookie Betts and Freddie Freeman. They did have three walks. James Outman, 0 for two, but did walk twice with a big stolen base there in the ninth inning. So Scott, I think it's a pretty safe bet that Julio is going on top of this podium. Um, who do you got second and third uh, behind him? I'm going to say, hmm, I'm going to, I really want to go with, uh, I really want to go Mookie. Honestly, I really want to go Mookie bets there because, you know, another two hit night two RBI night. He's, you know, talked about himself. He's his job up there is to get on base. You know, when he swung on that three Oh fastball, uh, yesterday, you know, post game, he was talking about that. He does not a three Oh, a three Oh swing guy. Like his job yeah. is to get on base. So to see him really, you know, understand the situation and that's kind of what he's done lately, uh, is, you know, turn into a real situational hitter. So to, for him to have come up here, have a two RBI night right at the top of the lineup. Uh, I I'm loving the hell out of how Mookie's playing right now. Freddie for me, number three, uh, it's pretty easy. He's just continuing, you know, both of them right at the top of the yeah. order to really push for an MVP bid. And it's, you know, like it's a conversation needs to grow. It's closer than people think. Yeah. Yeah. So you've got Mookie two, Freddie three. I actually yeah. think to the chat's point, there's probably two guys that you didn't mention in contention. David Peralta with the home run robbery potential. You think that ball was going out? It looked dicey. The first replay I saw, I said, I don't know if that ball's going out. I'm not taking away anything from the catch because I've tried running backwards and robbing something up against the wall and, trying to figure out how far the wall is, when you need to jump, et cetera, et cetera. There's a lot going on, but an incredible play from David Peralta. Did you think that ball was going out? I think so. Okay. I think that was going out. Yeah. The fan fans and me up there made like a, like made the reaction, like it was clear in the wall. So I'm, I'm, yeah. I'll say it was out. Yeah. And then I think Outman's the other guy that could get mentioned here for that stolen base in the ninth inning. Um, sure. But I think there's lots. I'll go Mookie too. Um, just because he gets the go ahead RBI there, or I should say the game winning RBI. And then I'll go Peralta three. I think that's a big catch. I mean, if we think that's going out, that's a two run home run that he brings back. And so yeah. give me Peralta and Mookie in some order, James Outman, Freddie Freeman. I mean, all five of those guys, um, deserve credit, but to me, it's Julio by a mile as I'm putting these rankings together. You agree? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, let's get to some questions here. And as we do, Scott, let's talk real quick, because one thing we haven't mentioned on this show, and if you missed the video, once we're done here, go check it out. Dodger Blue 1958 on YouTube. Um, the Dodgers made a pretty significant signing today. There were rumors the last couple of days that they were going to sign a 19-year-old out of South Korea, projected to be the number one pick in the KBO. 
announced, hey, I'm not actually going to go play in the KBO. I want to go over to Major League Baseball. Um, he gets that that report comes out. Then the Dodgers are connected. They had just traded for some international free agent money. They go and get him. We've got an interview with Daniel Kim, who broke that story. He's kind of a KBO insider. He broke that story, came on our show, talked about, hey, a lot of guys have come over in the last few years, a couple high school guys that have gotten you know high six-figure signing bonuses. But MLB scouts say this guy is the best of the bunch. Um, so good news from the Dodgers there. 6'3", throws 97 miles an hour. Um, good stuff for the Dodgers. $900,000 reported the signing. So, I mean, I'm not expecting you to have a scouting report, but Andrew Friedman continues to cook. Yes, he does. And this is, does it again. Yeah. I, I, yeah. You know, the haters can weep all they want. Andrew Friedman does it again. Yeah. Um, okay. We got a couple questions here. Let's get to these. Uh, a couple questions about Victor Gonzalez. Roy wants to know Hudson who pitched over the weekend. Why did we send him down for Gonzalez? Gonzalez is another unreliable Vesia and Ferguson. IV also asked thoughts on Victor Gonzalez being called up. Brian Hudson was sent down. Victor Gonzalez brought up. Um, any thoughts here on that decision by the Dodgers? Uh, I mean, you know, you really, with Caleb Ferguson struggling, you need to see what Victor Scott, you have to, uh, early on, he looked pretty solid, but you know, his ERA as you know, everybody talks about ERA, you know, five, three, two. Um, but his, his FIP is one where it's something that I think they could work with, but you do need to give Victor some innings. Uh, so I'm okay bringing him up. It's a spot where I think it's okay to it, Ferguson looks a little overworked. Uh, he looks a little frustrated. So I think this is a perfect time to maybe, you know, give Victor some of those outings, uh, low leverage, see what you got. Same thing. Dave Roberts said, he kind of gave everyone the blueprint, look out for him to really look for guys to be in some particular role. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see kind of how that plays out. If that is in fact what the Dodgers are doing, I was trying to figure out like, are the diamondbacks particularly bad against lefties? I mean, they're kind of middle of the pack 18th in major league baseball in OPS. So Maybe you're looking at that and saying, hey, let's get another lefty in the bullpen there. Um, you know, Victor's had kind of an up and down season. The first chunk of the season, um, you know, you look at April, uh, doesn't allow his first earned run until May 20th. So basically goes a month with zero earned runs, gets kind of roughed up in that one, three earned runs, but then he goes another one, two, three, four, eight appearances, allowing just a couple of runs. So a pretty good stretch. Unfortunately, it kind of, spun out from there three of his last six appearances he allowed three earned runs apiece in all three of those so um look to your point victor gonzalez um has had stretches the dodgers need lefties like if you don't trust vesia caleb ferguson's been a mess see what you got obviously ryan yarbrough another lefty although i think he's probably a starter at this point so something to keep an eye on there we got a uh Super chat from Saki Bomb, so we appreciate that. Do we feel Tony Gonsolin's time in the rotation is coming to an end? Scott gives up, what was it, six earned runs the other night. Does battle back and get through six innings, which was helpful even at that point. Um, but what do you think? Like, when the Dodgers get healthy, is, is Gonsolin's spot in the rotation in jeopardy? I think so. I would say so, yes. Like, it's... When push comes to shove, when they do need someone that can really avoid kind of a blow up, I know every every starter is prone to blow up outings, but Tony Gonsolin's not missing as many bats right now. Like his arsenal feels a bit limited. Like yeah, it's just for me from from the good old eye test, it just feels like that. You know he he looks a little bit you know hindered by something. You know when he had that hiccup with his his metrics, his fastball wasn't looking as good. Uh, it kind of felt like he was a bit exposed. Yeah. So I would say so, yeah. Uh, and uh, I don't know where they're kind of going to slot Sheehan, but I would say that when Kershaw comes back, uh, I think definitely that they're going to have to evaluate where Tony Gonsolin's at. Uh, I'm not even, I'm not sure where he'd, he'd fit in the bullpen. Like I, I, they definitely will. It's not like I'm saying, yeah, they're going to relegate him somewhere else, but yeah, they're going to have to find some role for him. But for now he'll be eating innings and yeah, he'll be, they'll have to let him continue to work it out. And the offense will need to pick him up. Uh, definitely when he's out there. Yeah. I mean, you look at the Dodgers, Kershaw do back Thursday, Julio pitching. Well, Lance Lynn pitching. Well, there's three starters you feel good about. Bobby mm -hmm. Miller has struggled. Um, I think he's allowed like three earned runs or more in a bunch of starts over the last couple of months. Um, obviously Michael Grove on the injured list. Emma Sheehan got optioned. Ryan Yarbrough is in the mix. So you just kind of do the math here on, yeah. on who the Dodgers have as options. And I think 
you're not going to want to, you, you probably don't want to hear that, but it just right now they need Gonsolin. Um, whether we, might be whether we like it or not. And might so, be hurt. what's that? He might be hurt. Like I, you know, I feel like I, I think he might be hurt. Like it's, yeah. he hasn't looked anything like himself. And so it's, but it, it, I, if they wouldn't put him out there, if it was something that he couldn't pitch through, but he's yeah. definitely not able to, you know, find that version of himself. You just, just like you saw with Julio, uh, yeah. pre like pre IL, he comes out of there, looks refreshed. He's pitching like himself. So I'm not sure uh, it, we're so far gone that, you know, a, an extended absence from Gonsolin might put his, you know, his availability as far as length and jeopardy. Yeah. Um, so they'll have to find a role for him. I'm, you know, to your point, I'm not sure it's, it's starting because of the numbers game. Yeah. They, they're, well, I'm, they're going to need starters. I mean, yeah. until Sheehan is available to be brought back until Grove is brought back, they need people like they don't yeah. have a surplus of starters at the major league level right now. Ryan Yarbrough is in the rotation. Tony Gonsolin is in the rotation. They're the number four and five starters right now. I'm with you. I mean, I think he could probably benefit from a 10 day IL stint 15 day, just sort of reset the mind a little bit, mm -hmm. throw a couple of bullpens and bounce back. Um, but they just can't afford to do it right now. So it's not coming to an end at least for the next couple of weeks while a bunch of those guys are either in the minors or hurt, but and, and I just think to your point, Scott, the way you handled the bullpen, hey, test these guys out. The Dodgers need Gonsolin. Like the Dodgers, of all the starting pitchers, we've at least seen him do it at the major league level and consistently prevent runs. And so if you can find a way to get him back, to get his confidence back, I don't know if that's working through it on the mound. I don't know if that's a, a IL stint, but I think Gonsolin's going to be an important piece for the Dodgers. So something to keep in mind. A um, couple more chats. So thank you again for the super chat, Saki Bomb. We greatly appreciate it. Noah wants to know. Um, we'll do a couple rapid fire ones here, Scott. Given how he has been doing defensively, like robbing Tatis and offensively, do you think James Outman has a chance to win rookie of the year? I think Corbin Carroll's got this thing wrapped up. I mean, he could probably miss the rest of the season and he might still win it. But um, what do you think? Do you think Outman has, uh, has a little bit of a run here? I was going to try and look up his odds while we're answering this. I think Corbin Carroll's kind of got it locked up. He's had like a 4.3 F war. Uh, I'm not sure after tonight, once that updates, but I think he's, he had such a, you know, a hot start and he had some, you know, decent swings tonight. I don't think that, you know, we'd like that to be the case that, you know, if Altman's, if Altman's, uh, you know, struggle wasn't so, you know, elongated, it'd be, yeah. you know, a much closer com conversation, but I think that he's kind of got it in the bag, you know, barring anything crazy. Um, uh, but, Outman's been insane. Like Outman's yeah. been playing out of his mind. So it's a conversation. I just don't know how serious it gets. So, yeah. but I, I don't think he's real. I don't think he's got a shot. I think that Corbin yeah. Carroll's kind of got it a little bit out of the way. Vegas says no conversation. Corbin yeah. Carroll's minus 3000. You'd get <laughs> nine to one odds on anybody else. You could take the whole field against Corbin Carroll. James Outman is 150 to one. So if you're feeling incredibly lucky, throw some money on James Outman and hope he OPS is 1500 from here on out. And Corbin Carroll gets hurt david along the same lines do you think freddie freeman catches acuna for the mvp i think it's going to be a nice story mookie Betts and freddie freeman but i think they're battling for second here is my estimation um looking at odds acuna is minus 700 freeman is plus 450 mookie is plus 3000 so huge gap between freddie and mookie as far as odds go but minus 700 for ronald acuna jr feels like that's going to be another runaway yeah, no, it's right. It's just so tough to because it's 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 close. But the stolen base is what Ronald Acuna is doing, stealing bags. Hasn't we haven't seen this in forever? Crazy. Like, dude might get a has a potential of like a you know forty eighty season, yeah. which is nuts. Like, it might yeah. even be crazier than that. So, yeah, uh, I hope like that Freddie continues this pace so it's close. Uh, and I never want to see an injury, so I hope Ronald Acuna is okay. I know he got drilled tonight uh, by an upper 90s fastball right on the elbow, so we'll see how that goes. But uh, I think he's okay. Uh, but Freddie is playing out of his mind, and the, the the fact that he's even able to be in the conversation right now is just you know another testament to what Freddie's able to do without the ability to steal you know as many bags and volume as Ronald Acuna is doing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, uh, 25 to 23 is the home run total. 99 tied at 99 for runs. Freddie Freeman's got 13 more RBIs. He's got 0 .001 higher batting average, 340 to 339. He's three points behind him and on base. He's 13 points ahead slugging. What am I saying? It's all tied. Then you look at stolen bases, 53 to 16. Acuna, obviously, 
um, has the edge there. So that's a difference. I mean, according to Fangraphs War, 6.1 for Acuna, and then Freddie Freeman's at 5.8. Mookie Betts is at 5.2. And then if Otani, the hitter, is at 5.8, which is just bonkers when you do the math on that one. So um, anyways, uh, a couple questions here. Similar, TQT. Bush hit another homer tonight if JD goes on the DL, IL. Do the Dodgers remember they have Michael Bush ready and waiting, or do you think they've already traded, or do they think they've already <laughs> traded him away? Elishiva, JD out again tonight from injury. Will we bring up Bush? I was looking up what Twitter had to say. Fabian Ardaya um, tweeting that JD Martinez is headed back to Los Angeles for an MRI after getting scratched from the lineup. Same mm-hmm. issue that caused him to risk, miss time recently. But Ardaya mentions doesn't sound like an IL stint. The hope Robert said is that an injection knocks us out from being an issue the rest of the season. So look, I think it's pretty clear that if my, if, if JD were to go on the injured list, it would have to be Michael Bush that would get called up. It feels like the obvious thing. I think he had eight home runs in four days or something this past week. Um, but unfortunately for Michael Bush, people, fortunately for JD Martinez, it sounds like they're optimistic, that there's not going to be, um, an IL stint there. Um, all of you wants to know, what did you make of the Lugo statement? This was Lugo. We've got a video um, that I believe will be coming out tomorrow. So keep an eye out for that about his comments that the Dodgers were stealing signs. Dave Roberts saying, sounds like an excuse to me. Um, any thoughts on that, Scott? What's what did he say again? I glanced at it. Like I know that what, what Dodger players were saying about it, like their response, but the exact, the exact statement from Lugo that, that he believed that they were, they were stealing signs from second base. Um, yeah, I think, uh, I'm trying to see if I can find a, uh, here we go. Let's see if I can find some quotes there. Um, when asked Lugo said he felt the Dodgers knew it was coming in the fateful fourth. He said he thought they'd been relaying pitch grips from second base, though he refused to use it as an excuse. Sounds like he did use it as an excuse saying he needed to be more conscious. You just try and stay locked in and focused on executing pitches and some other stuff slips your mind. I knew coming in what they were going to do, especially on second base. Um, those were his comments. This is via AJ Cassavell of MLB.com. Um, I was going to see if we could find any specific quotes. I mean, and uh, I know that Dodger players reacted to that. Like, you know, I can't, I don't have zero idea what they're, what he's talking about. And I hope because no player is going to say, yeah, we knew it, you know, relaying it. But uh, yeah, I would just say to the Julio, you know, or to Seth Lugo, you know, get better, man. You know, don't, yeah, don't Freddie Freeman, that quote, that's news to me. Peralta, I don't know what he's talking about. Hayward, if that's what he wants to put out there, then cool, I guess. Um, Dave Roberts called it surprising and then said, quote, sounds like an excuse. So great stuff there from Dave Roberts. It's a tough um, scene, dude. Don't you know, don't let that happen to this type of lineup. As many veteran hitters as there are, you know? Yep, yep. What do you mean to um, tell you? Dodger, Dodger Blue's got a great question for us here, Scott. You're at the movies as one member of our staff was neither you or I, cause we're here working, getting ready Correct. for tonight's show. Yes. Um, what's your, what's your, do you have a go-to movie setup? I'm going to be honest. I'm a cheapo. So there's not a whole lot of movie sort of snacks being purchased. Cause I probably already feel like I took a hit getting a couple tickets to the show, but let's just say a hypothetical, uh, you're at the movies. What are you crushing? Oh, uh, sour patch watermelon. Oh yeah. It's great. Yes. Correct. Popcorn. I'm okay. Eh, I'll buy it for Nora. I'll get a big bucket for her and she'll clear it before I even have a chance. But yeah, popcorn's chill. <laughs> good answer. I You yeah. were hesitating there. I was like, oh, Scott's going to be an anti No, no, no. I, I got you. Me. Popcorn's good. Popcorn's good stuff. One, you grab one handful and then you're sitting there like, I don't want any more. And next thing you know, you're, you're double fisting. Yeah, I'm the and just going I want it. a lot more. Uh, I, how much butter are we throwing? Are we throwing extra butter on that bad boy out at the concession stand? Oh, man. You know, I don't. Yeah, no, I'm good. Uh, no, I can't do that. You extra Sorry. butter for me baby Nora's all over it yeah I'm with you uh I'm not a soda guy so no soda for me but yeah give me something sour sour patch kids I'm with you Scott sour patch watermelon elite have you tried this I think it's kind of new to me at least nerds cl- nerd clusters have you had oh these man yet? yeah absolutely I've got a whole group of buddies that's they swear by it yeah it's elite it's it's elite it. candy so yep. there you go um uh let's see uh um somebody asking did the deal with hyun suk young get done today what do you guys think of him um by all reports his agency has confirmed it he has a statement saying he's excited i believe the official signing isn't happening for a few more days but all of the reporting around it is that it's done and most of that reporting is coming directly from him or his agency so it's good um 
like I said earlier, Daniel Kim, who broke the news, was on our channel with me. Basically, as it was happening, it was kind of funny. We were recording, and as soon as I got off, all the news <laughs> broke. So we're talking, and I'm like, how done is this? And he's like, well, you know, until it's pen to paper, and then it's, like, official. Um, but he basically said, hey, this guy's a second, third, fourth round high school pitcher. That's the way that you should view it. And the Dodgers got him without having to, you know, pay a huge signing bonus in the four, like you would normally do in the draft. And they didn't have to burn a draft pick on him. They just basically had to trade a couple of low level prospects for some international spending money that they could go out and get it. So um, it's a slam dunk. He is 19. So, yeah, I mean, we're talking like four Give or five time. years minimum before yeah. we see this guy in the majors, but, but it's but for perspective, see. but for perspective, everyone, uh, he was, you know, he could have been the number one overall pick in the KBO draft. So just, yeah. just that for perspective that this is, so it gives you a little gravity to it. like, this is, uh, this is a big move like that. The Dodgers trade away, just like Jeff said, they traded away two low level guys to, you know, get some international bonus pool money from the Chicago White Sox. And that one deal allowed them yeah. to take care of this because they did use the Dodgers did use uh, most of their uh, international bonus pool money. So that one deal allowed them to sign this guy who had a you know yeah. a shot to be the number one pick in the KBO draft. Yeah, it's good stuff. Michael was tweeting about peanuts in the, uh, or excuse me, M and M's in the uh, movie theater one. Do you have a favorite M and M, Scott? Uh, peanut. Peanut, huh? Peanut M and M's. Butter. Peanut butter M and M's all man. day. Elite. Just, that's. I mean, you know, it's the same. You know, kind of the same deal. But I get it. It's just a lot. I'm good yeah. on. Uh, I'll take peanut. Peanut's good. Okay, let's get one last question here from TQT. Which starter would make a good reliever this year? Sheehan, Grove, Pepio, or Gonsolin? Uh, my answer is yes. To this question, Scotty, what do you say? Oh, uh, Sheehan. Okay. His, I love his fastball. His fastball yeah. is incredible. That's that's what I want. So that's for me. Uh, we saw him right away. Like he had you know great results there. That was the start with Julio. You know the yeah. little piggyback there. That's that was a perfect. Uh, if people want to look for themselves, it was the you know uh, August third start against the A's. Look that up. That was Emma Sheehan's. You know, kind of a little audition there. You know, kind of one of the best. Uh, things he's had and, you, and you'll really see how they like his, why they like his fastball coming out of the bullpen. So for me, it's, it's Emmett. Yeah. And look, Grove has looked good in the mm -hmm. bullpen. I mean, they basically told him, Hey, you get five batters the other day, he struck out four of them. So you've liked what you've seen from Grove when he's been in there in short stints. I've joked for a couple of years that Pepio could be one of their best relievers just because upper nineties fastball and a devastating changeup when he's right. Um, he's had, his last outing, his last rehab outing was a good one. So I don't know when he's going to come back. I see that question. Um, but Pepio, I think could be money. She and you mentioned, and then, you know, Gonsolin, same thing. Like it's, it's a devastating split change with a fastball that if he only had to pitch for one inning, maybe he gets up to 95, 96. So I, I think all those guys, I mean, I've said it all along, solve the starting pitcher, um, solve your starting pitcher problem. <laughs> or excuse me, get enough starting pitchers and bump some of these guys to the bullpen and it'll probably solve your bullpen problem. So yeah, I would say all of these guys, I might go Grove just because I like what I've seen from him. And, it was and impressive. Think, they know his matchups. They know exactly when to deploy him. Obviously lefties see him really well, but righties he's been pretty nasty against. So if you can get him into the right situation, I might take Grove, um, then she and then Pepe. Uh, Gonsolin might honestly be last on that list for me. Yes. As crazy as it sounds. Yeah. For but. me, he's, he's last for me on that, but uh, why I like Sheehan, I know it was the Oakland A's, but he pitched four innings against the yeah. A's and in that four inning stretch, he had 15 whiffs. Yeah. That's, you know, in nine on his fastball, nine yeah. of his 31 fastballs generated a whiff. So that's why I'm like, yes, love it. You know, love give it. it to me, man. Okay. One last question. Cause you love the food ones. Ivy wants to know your favorite McFlurry flavor, Scotty. Wow, I haven't had a McFlurry. I still remember when the McFlurry came out, and I don't. I'll say this before anything: I, you're not an actual human being if you didn't think the spoon. It might be is the spoon a straw? Yeah, we we kind of. I feel like this is come up that? before. Yeah, I think I can't remember. Um, oh, but I'll, I'll answer it. Uh, Oreo. Oreo. Yeah. Okay, so you're just kind of a runner. That's just you know. Sort I just, of, yeah, I like Oreo. Yeah. Oreos are Oreos um, are. Killer. I don't think it was a straw. It had a handle because that's what the machine used. I think is is um, there you go. But I, I, Reese's for me is uh, is the choice here. Um, favorite mo matcha. Matt wants to know. Scotty, I don't have one. <laughs> Big green tea matcha guy. Green tea is great. Green yeah. tea, green tea uh, mochi. 
mochi. Okay. And yeah. Prom- and mochi's, mochi's, mochi's delicious. It's fantastic. So, My girlfriend loves that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There yeah. you go. Wow, big brag. All right. There you go, folks. <laughs> hey, we appreciate you joining us. Dodgers win 5-4 over the Diamondbacks. They've won seven of their last eight. They've got a five-game lead on the division. As always, we appreciate you. Please check out DodgerBlue.com for all the latest news. We'll have a post-game write-up as always. Uh, check out Dodger Blue 1958 right here on YouTube. Subscribe, ring the notification bell as well. And if you're a podcast person, Apple, Spotify, Google, please subscribe, ring the notif- uh follow, rate, review the Dodger Heads podcast. We greatly appreciate that. Is Scott Gearman. My name is Jeff Spiegel. Again, Dodgers win five to four. So enjoy the rest of your night. Enjoy the rest of your day. And as always, go gritty Dodgers. Let's go.